Good morning, folks. My name is Marshall McDaniel. I'm an assistant professor in soil plant interactions in the agronomy department at Iowa State. And if you are watching this video, this means that the uh, link that Philip um, and the connection there in the office wasn't working well. So you have to watch a video. Hopefully, I'll still be online and be able to follow up with some questions. I'll give you all my email as well. Uh, in case you have any questions after my talk, and I'll give that twice, uh, next slide and then at the end of the talk. But anyways, I'm happy to be invited and here talking with you all about um, kind of the, the uh, economics of soil health, or what I call here soil health in the bottom line, or how improvements in soil health can make you money. All right, let's get started here. Um, I'm going to try to use the laser pointer here. Um, let's hope that doesn't crash the video. But what I'll be talking about today is the background and how we got here. Um, just a little bit of background on soil health to make sure we're all using the same terminology and same understanding. And then I'll talk about three ways improving soil health might pay off or benefit your bottom line. One, increasing yields either directly or indirectly through soil health. Uh, decreasing inputs um, so uh, inputs like fertilizer, uh, and fertilizer would be the example I use actually. And then three, talk about something I'm sure you have all have heard lately. There's quite the buzz going on around soil carbon and or ecosystem service markets. So we'll talk about all three of those in this talk. I'll end with some take home messages and then have time for some Q&A hopefully. Um, and uh, oh, before I move on, I just want to mention, here's my email, uh, marsh, M-A-R-S-H, at iastate.edu. And you can find out all the, about all the cool research that uh, the folks in my lab do at, um, on Twitter at soil underscore plant underscore interactions. And I'm at Iowa State University, as I mentioned earlier. Move my little video there for a second. Okay, so one of the ways I always like to start off with is talking about what soil health is. And to me, soil health is really about soil functions or what we want a soil to do for us um, and what it does for the rest of the world and the environment. And these are the soil functions as laid out by the Food and Agriculture Organization. And uh, functions are those um, soils deliver these services that make life on Earth and ha are habitable. But the ones I want to focus on and where soil organic matter is really central to are these ones that we care about as agronomists. So provision of food, fiber, and fuel often thought of as the, the primary goal of agronomy. Carbon sequestration, we'll talk more about this in this talk and, and now is a hot topic. Water purification, soil contaminant reduction, climate regulation. Cycling of nutrients to plants and recycling nutrients from uh, waste, plant and animal waste. A habitat for organisms, like uh, from everything from so, uh, the smallest organisms or microorganisms up to larger organisms like uh, moles. And then regulating floods and storing water. Um, all of these are things that a healthy sh soil should do to its maximum capacity in a way that improves all of our lives. That's a good way to think about um, soil health. And I put soil organic matter here in the central, or in kind of the center hub, because it really is important in all of these aspects of, uh, all these soil functions or aspects of soil health. Um, where I'll, 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 I'll extend this into how it, this relates to the bottom line is that many of these functions are directly or indirectly related to on-farm profits, right? Directly provisioning of food, fiber, fuel, that's how uh, one of the major sources of income on most farms. And also I want to mention that uh, losing um, the ability of these functions in soils often causes externalities. And now what is an externality? So I'm not an economist. So I'm going to have to pull up Merriam-Webster's definition and provide you my own definition as well. So an externality, uh, uh, number three here, is a secondary or unintended consequence. So, um, in, but in economics lingo, it's a side effect or consequence, in this case of agriculture, that affects other parties 
um, without being reflected in the total cost of goods of services involved. So um, I, I bring this up because it's good to think about the greater costs of soil management or mismanagement. Um, so reducing externalities so that the, that the greater society has to pay less um, for um, soils that aren't performing to their optimum in, in all of these functions. Um, so we'll come back to that idea. But before we do, I want to explain a little bit about uh, where we are at now and how we got here. So um, I'm going to take the Des Moines lobe, for example, here. I've got the Des Moines lobe here. So this is Iowa, those of you that are not um, either from Iowa or familiar with Iowa. This region is called the Des Moines lobe. Des Moines is at the, the bottom of this, this lobe. And this lobe is a land, one of the, these several landform regions of Iowa. These are kind of the, the starting parent material of Iowa soils. And this, uh, these landform regions are really dictate how soils function, but then within there, how we manage them also affects that. But uh, the Des Moines lobe was, um, soil organic matter was created between 10 and 14,000 years prior to uh, European Americans uh, uh, cultivating the soil. So that's uh, on the bottom here, I've got prior to cultivation and years after cultivation. So prior to this, um, several thousand years, organic matter has been built up to this level, right, relative soil organic matter. Now I'm going to remove this graph and, and show what happened over time. Um, so prior, however, prior to Euro-American cultivation, there were Native Americans farming in Iowa from three to 4,000 years. We don't know their impacts on soil. There's no good agronomic data, nor um, how they man, uh, uh, manage soil organic matter or their effects on soil organic matter. But we can safely say that it probably did not deplete organic matter um, as much as uh, Euro-American cultivation did. So this is what um, this point in time reveals. So this is uh, when the clock starts, Euro-American uh, cultivation begins. And from, based on data we have, even from the Midwest here, cultivation has depleted uh, soil organic matter by roughly about 50%. Um, and this loss of soil organic matter means we're also losing some of those soil ecosystem services I just showed in that, that um, pie chart earlier too. And then uh, here we've got, um, here we've got uh, present day and what I like to call a man, and, and we've got, we're faced with a choice if we're managing land. We can continue on this trajectory and it'll probably plateau, we'll end up with 50% less organic matter. Or you can take a management intervention and regenerate soil organic matter, and restore those ecosystem services that were so critical for um, soil functioning, but also critical for um, those agronomic services we expect of soils. And so soil organic matter might increase at this rate um, over uh, uh, decades, or perhaps this rate, so even greater increase in soil organic matter this rate, we don't know if it'll ever reach original relative soil organic matter. There are very few um, uh, native uh, untilled uh, grass, grassland and savannas around the Midwest. Um, there are very few of them, but there are some that we know maybe what the, the soil organic matter levels or, or concentrations were. And we don't know if we'll ever return to that. The other thing I want to mention here is that the um, uh, what caused this is a combination of many things, and we don't know the primary cause, but we know it was a combination of things. It was a combination of tillage, right? That's the one that gets a lot of the credit. Also, likely contributor was um, subsurface tile drainage, so much of Iowa and the Midwest is, is uh, artificially drained with corrugated plastic tubing now. Um, that's dried out the soil, increased mineralization, and released some of this organic matter. And there are other factors, too, that are thought to contribute this to this, um, but I won't go into in details here. So the question is, you know, with, with monitoring soil health and thinking about soil health is, you know, which of these trajectories are we on when we have a management intervention? 
and how do we track this, and more specific for this talk, what does this mean for our bottom line or profits on the farm if we are implementing a management intervention of soil health um, promoting practice. Uh, here I want to take some time just to talk about carbon because uh, it's been receiving a lot of attention lately. And with carbon, this is what we want to, to buy and track with carbon markets, right? But with carbon, if I didn't make this clear already, it's, it's connected to soil organic matter and that's connected to finally um, soil health. And I'll, I'll show that in a little bit. But what, I, what I'm doing here is using what's called the transitive properties. And you might remember this from your algebra, um, maybe uh, high school algebra class where if A is, is like B and B is like C, then that means A is like C, right? So that's the quintessential transitive property. So soil organic matter is made up of carbon. We think it's about 58% carbon, but it also contains these other elements, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And so when carbon is what we want to track, but all of these other things, and this will come into play here in a moment too, uh, when we talk about the, um, the kind of benefits of increasing soil carbon, right? We're getting, we're also increasing these other elements that are in organic matter. And often you'll hear, and sometimes I even do this, I use soil organic carbon or soil organic matter interchangeably, but carbon is actually the element we're talking about. The interest of it is because uh, with climate change and why people are buying credits is because of its connection with um, CO2 in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. So, um, but soil organic matter is made up of carbon, but also these other elements. And then soil organic matter, as I made uh, clear with the, the food and agriculture, the FAO pie chart, is central to all these soil ecosystem services, like the ability of soils to hold water, filter waters, um, uh, stay uh, stable and not, uh, uh, not erode, nutrient storage and release, and climate change mitigation as the case is with carbon directly. And then finally, all, if you combine all those soil ecosystem services, that's kind of what I like to think of as soil health. And here's a little bit of data on where that, um, uh, that decline in soil organic matter uh, values that I showed come from. So these are uh, um, 11 independent studies from around the Midwest and a few in kind of the South and Southeast, but mostly in the Midwest. And these are soil carbon stocks. So a stock is just a mass per area, right? So if we look at this kind of block diagram here, it would be area. And in this case, we're talking about hectares. And this is not milligrams. This is actually megagrams. Um, or uh, uh, 1 million grams of carbon per hectare. And so 15 centimeters depth is a very frequently measured depth uh, for soil carbon. That's about six inches. Uh, but some of these studies varied uh, in their depth of measurement from 10 centimeters up to um, three feet. Um, and I'll have you guess which one was three feet. Uh, in just a moment. But what I want to point out first is that uh, the average, uh, or, or there's two bars here. One is the native grassland in the maroon or cardinal color. And then the yellow um, is the cropland. So these are all studies that sampled soils in the native grassland, so never been plowed, and those in the cropland. So the difference between these two is, is the soil organic matter, soil carbon gap. And if you average these out, it's about 46%. The deficit, we're at a, about a 46% deficit. So we've got about 50% um, that we could improve upon or, or, or fill up, or in other words, double what we've got now. According, if, if you, you um, based on the assumption that we can uh, uh, bring soil organic carbon organic matter back to um, that level of native grassland. Um, let's look at just a few of the studies that are in uh, kind of the Des Moines lobe area or soil, kind of similar soils. So two independent studies from Iowa, 
one in Minnesota, and then a study in both Iowa and Minnesota. And they range from, you know, 40% of uh, total to a little bit closer to um, the native grassland at 82%. So there's a lot of variability. The average is about, the take home point is that we're about a 50% deficit. Now I ask, which of these do you think is the, the um, study that sampled to three feet deep? Take some time and pick out which one you think sampled to three feet deep, which would be um, about 10 meters or 100 centimeters. This was the study, uh, the Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, that sampled to 10 feet deep. And it's reflected in just the overall mass of soil carbon. So this is one of the tricky things with measuring soil carbon is it depend a, a stock, you know, how much there there is per area depends on how deep you sample. So the deeper you sample, the more carbon you're going to account for. And this was the study that sampled the deepest, um, which sampled down to 10, um, 10 feet, or 300 centimeters. OK, so I'm, now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. These are the five principles of soil health. So I borrow this. I like this, um, this way of putting in um, the, the ways that we can increase soil health. These are the principles of soil health from the USDA NRCS. Um, and they break those down into practices that armor soil, minimize disturbance, increase plant diversity, have continual live plant root, some, some people call this perenniality, and then also reintegrate livestock or animals into the landscape too. And so under these principles, I've just listed a couple uh, uh, practices that would qualify for this. So soil armor, cover crops, leaving more residue, um, on the field to protect, protect from water and wind erosion, reducing, using reduced tillage, and then converting to CRP or prairie strips, minimize disturbance. Some of these you'll see that the practices can count for more than one um, principle. So reduced tillage shows up in minimizing disturbance, lowering compaction through a practice like controlled traffic, where you try to avoid um, uh, uh, taking machinery out on the entire field and restrict it to a few areas that get uh, uh, more traffic than others. Uh, so concentrating the traffic, in other words. CRP or prairie strips can minimize this, right, because we take them out of production. And then we, in, for increasing plant diversity, you can use cover crop mixtures, crop rotations, intercropping, CRP or prairie strips also increase the number of plants per unit of area um, on a farm. Uh, for continual live plant roots, cover crops cover this one as well. Perennial, using a perennial crop like switchgrass or miscanthus uh, or kernza, there's some grain crops now that are perennial. Relay cropping and then CRP or prairie strips, you can see cover many of these. Um, and then you can also um, use grazing of cover crops with animals to kind of reintegrate livestock. You can seed pastures like growing alfalfa in rotation for a longer rotation. That also covers the, the increasing the perenniality if you grow alfalfa over a two or three year period. And then just adding manure back onto a farm rather than using synthetic fertilizer can be a form of reintegrating livestock. Okay, so now that you've seen all the soil health principles here, I want to talk about how this, these principles might be linked to um, profits. And, and they're linked in what I like to call the virtuous cycle of soil health. And those of you familiar with this idea of virtuous cycle, it's just another name for a, uh, um, a positive feedback where you have something happen in that circle and it tends to just facilitate or increase even further um, uh, uh, feedbacks. So here, let's say you choose to, to use one or more of these practices that increase the soil health on your farm. Then you'll have some benefits. Um, there are also benefits that might just occur independent of soil health. And I, uh, I might 
refer to these as indirect or coincidental benefits of the management practice. And then those management practices can increase your profits or income, or your profits by either increasing income or the input. That could be through increasing yield, increasing soil carbon, which can over time have, that happens slowly. It's not going to happen over a couple years even. Um, and then increase those ecosystem services I talked about. So these are all things that could be related to income or decrease expenses. So uh, um, reliance on nitrogen fertilizer, decrease passes, so decrease your gas, maybe decrease pesticide use, as in the case of using cover crops to reduce um, weeds. I just heard a story on how... Uh, um, uh, resistance of uh, um, uh, of water hemp to dicamba is really out of control uh, in Illinois in some fields. A study was just published on that recently. But um, these both interact as well. So some of these practices that are increasing your income also might decrease expenses and vice versa. Those then go into whether or not you're making profit at the field level. And then that, to complete the virtuous circle, that might influence your decision as a producer to implement more uh, soil health promoting practices based on the uh, uh, NRCS principles of soil health. And then it just has further kind of feedbacks, um, increasing profits more and more over time. Uh, I had an asterisk here. I said I'd come back to externalities. The uh, interesting thing is, so besides thinking about profits on your own farm, many of these um, management practices also decrease externalities or the costs that other folks um, have to pay either downstream or downwind uh, based on poor agriculture management. So you're having both a local effect, maybe on increasing your profits through soil health, but also increasing society's um, profits or decreasing external costs. Okay, so anyways, I'm going to pause here for a moment, let you take this in. I'm going to go back to this slide, and I'm going to go over through a few examples of how we might see evidence of this uh, uh, virtuous cycle in action. And I'm going to start with the increasing yields. I'm going to talk about two examples or uh, evidence, I should call it, uh, I'm going to talk about meta-analyses, and, and those of you not familiar with the meta-analysis, it's just a study of studies. So it means a, uh, a scientist looked at all the literature on a topic, let's say, no tillage, and the effects on yield, and they compiled all that data into one paper. And so there, you can imagine, the way I describe it, it's very powerful to make decisions and to look at an overall effect on something. So I'm going to show some evidence from some meta-analyses. And then I'm also going to show some local evidence from an on-farm study that um, a student, a former student of mine had conducted a couple years ago. Okay, so here are selected uh, soil health promoting practices that are based on those that affect one or more of those uh, soil health principles I showed previously and their effect on crop yield. So I, I picked three. There are a few more out there, but I think these are the three most important ones. So three, soil health promoting practice, crop rotation, cover crop, and no tillage. And then they have uh, uh, the comparison or the control, so what they're actually being compared to. So rotating one or more crop compared to a cover crop, having a cover crop with uh, annual crop where there is no winter cover crop, and then conventional tillage with disc or other methods conventional to that area versus having no tillage. And the overall change in crop yield is here. So, uh, and this is across all crops that are studied in the literature. This is the number of studies that were compiled. And then just a few other notes um, where, uh, from these meta-analyses that might be pertinent. So this first study on crop rotation, they found an overall increase in 20%. And uh, this was focused on, on studies in China. Uh, my colleague, uh, Fernando Miguez, and his student published this paper. They didn't find any effect on winter cover crops. And in fact, when you use legumes or mixtures of legumes, you actually get a 30% increase in yield. Um, 
uh, Cameron Pidelko and, and co-authors in 2015 published this paper where they found that no tillage had an overall negative 5% effect. And then corn was actually just slightly less, even more negative, so having a detrimental effect on yield. And so showing these changes on yield doesn't really tell you that either the reason why there was a positive effect or the reason why there was a negative. You have to really understand what's going on with soil health or know that there might be some other indirect factors. And what do I mean by that? So what are either increasing or decreasing yields in these soil health mechanisms, right? Which is one component of the income on the farm. So one, some of these practices might be increasing water when the plant needs it, but decreasing it when it doesn't through maybe improved soil structure and water holding capacity. Uh, two, these practices like uh, crop rotations, cover crops, um, no tillage might be increasing the nutrient supplying power of a soil through increased soil biological in activity, so increasing the mineralization rate of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur coming from organic matter, increasing the cation exchange capacity through increasing um, uh, uh, either increasing the pH uh, or increasing organic matter, which builds your, your cation exchange, the size of the bank or the jar that can hold cations in the soil, or just increasing organic matter in general. As I mentioned earlier, organic matter is made up of more than just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It has nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur in it. So not through biological activity, but just the pure increase of those elements that are also in organic matter could be increasing the nutrient supplying power of a soil. Um, and then you could be in increasing or improving conditions for root growth and nutrient and water acquisition as well. And then there are many other indirect um, non-soil health related effects that, that may just come along or be coincidental with some of those practices like weed or pest suppression, a change in soil temperature, um, other change in, in uh, kind of your management regime or the way you manage the field that might be affecting the yield rather than directly through um, uh, increasing um, uh, in, increasing the uh, uh, these aspects of soil health I list above. Um, but I do want to point out just the increasing the water when the plant needs it because we, we do have some evidence for this. Um, so based on a older study um, here, Hudson 1994, I have a figure shown here. But then also there's a new uh, study by the Soil Health Institute that found very similar results um, that for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, there's a 1% to 3% increase in soil mo moisture. And these are just showing two uh, um, uh, levels of, of water availability. Um, and you can think of these as uh, uh, field capacity water, so kind of the loosely held water by the soil and permanent wilting point. So the amount of water that's strongly held to the soil particles that um, anything below this is where plants really become moisture stressed. And the difference between these shows you the overall amount of water that is a plant available. So the field capacity is going up at a greater rate than the permanent wilting point, but the difference between here is the overall plant available water at about 8%. If you look at a soil that is 1%, this is the amount of plant available water that it has, and it only has 1% of organic matter. So that, that's kind of a, a summary of studies, but I'm going to show a little bit more uh, localized um, study of interest to you um, that's just uh, uh, a couple miles down the road here from Ames, Iowa, uh, Iowa State's campus. And this is the Marsden Farm uh, experiment that was established by uh, Dr. Matt Liebman, who will be retiring soon. And um, he established this experiment in 2002, and it was comparing a two-year corn-soybean rotation um, to a four-year diversified rotation with two years of alfalfa, so corn, soybean, alfalfa for two years, and also receiving animal manure. Um, the tillage intensity differs a little bit, and the tillage type differs depending on the rotation. But after 17 years, we sampled soil water on a monthly basis 
at 0 to 6 and 6 to 12 inches um, for three years. And the main idea or goal of this experiment is to look at how the corn soybean system, when also integrated with livestock, which when you diversify it with kind of a livestock approach, you get both the perennial crop, so you get two years of alfalfa uh, forage crop, plus the manure is altering the system. We want to see if that can allow us to reduce mineral mineral fertilizer and maintain profitability and yield. And yield. Um, we showed uh, uh, um, that it also can reduce mineral fertilizer needs. Uh, Matt and his colleagues did. I'm not going to go into that here. What I want to talk about is the water um, and what a little bit more about these treatments. So in year one and year two, both systems received corn, or both are in corn and soybean phase. Um, the two-year rotation on top receives all synthetic fertilizer. They see, receive the same amount. Um, in years three and four, we have oat as a companion crop and alfalfa. And alfalfa then is fully the year four. Um, and then the rotation begins at corn again. And it receives manure at the end of this um, alf uh, sec second alfalfa year and some nitrogen, uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer prior to corn. And as shown by this red bar here, but they received the, the same total amount of fertilizer, both rotations. Okay, and so this is what we saw. So this is over the years 2017, 2018, 2019. And the, these are the months we measured. So between April and December, and we were measuring once a month, and we measured over three years of both rotations. So in the two year was corn, soybean, corn. In the four year, corn, soybean, oat, alfalfa year. And these are the gravimetric water content. So this is purely not the how much water the soil can hold, but how much was there in the field in grams of water for every gram of dry soil. And what we see in the two year is in the circle, dashed lines, the four year is the blue with the triangle and solid lines. And what we see is that there's a consistent increase over all, all of the year. Um, 2017 was a very dry year, and in these really dry months, so July and August, there was still substantially more water in um, the four year rotation. But that's consistent over both the corn and soybean years, even in the drier month of August here in that year, um, and consistent when the crop was in oat and alfalfa as well. Um, so an, uh, on average, that diversified crop rotation, the four-year rotation, increased gravimetric water content by 16%. So this is more water that the plant has, um, and I think we calculated how many millimeters it was in at these two depths, and it was close to 11 more millimeters on average over um, over the growing season. And if we look at 6 to 12, it's kind of the same story, um, a little bit uh, less actually. Instead of 16%, we less of an average bump, so 11% greater across all these um, points. So it looks like more there's more of an effect in the upper um, soil. So this is uh, uh, similar to those meta-analyses I talked about, but this is the, uh, a study that looked at all these experiments, um, hundreds of experiments that use nitrogen inputs to increase yields, and looked at the soil carbon content. So from uh, just above zero up to three, slightly greater than 3%. And these are the corn yields and bushels per acre. And what these researchers found is that Yield tends to go up um, regardless of the nitrogen rate. So there are some, you know, lower to moderate nitrogen rates up here, um, 100, 200 uh, um, kilograms per hectare, uh, which is close. It's just about 10% uh, less than, 10% uh, uh, more than um, uh, 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 pounds per acre. And at about 2%, though, that uh, benefit seems to pay off. But at, you can also see here there's very few studies out at this, uh, these high concentrations of soil carbon. But if we look from a normal range, 0 to 2%, um, on average, 
corn yield does go up. So there's some pretty good evidence for that, uh, but not increasing it over 2%. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop here and, and uh, switch gears a little bit. So now I'm going to talk about increasing soil nitrogen supplying power. And here I'm going to show two soils, um, and they're both from this study published by Alan Franzluber in 2018. On the bottom we've got nitrogen fertilizer rate. These are real data, and corn grain yield and bushels per acre. And there's two soils here, soil A, um, these are the data points from soil A and the response to nitrogen and soil B. Which of these soils would you prefer? Would you rather have A or B? Well, I hope you all pick A. Uh, first of all, has a higher yield at zero, but then also the more nitrogen you add, the yield is actually decreasing. Um, Alan uh, drew a flat line or no relationship through it, but uh, you're wasting money on the soil by adding nitrogen to it. And there could be many reasons for that. Could have had alfalfa prior, could have been manured previous year, but for whatever reason that soil did not require nitrogen, whereas soil B, uh, when zero pounds of nitrogen were added, it only yielded about 55 um, bushels per acre. And to get to the agronomic optimum nitrogen rate, you needed about 200 pounds of nitrogen to produce that optimum corn, which was actually still lower than the highest from soil A, right? And this is uh, the amount of what I call nitrogen needs to make up for the deficit in soil B. Um, and it, you need to make up for a lack of nitrogen supplying power, whereas there was no nitrogen need for soil A. Okay, let me show what Okay, let's look at this another way. Here are those two soils I just showed, soil A and soil B, um, and it has the economic optimum nitrogen rate. So this soil needed zero uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre, whereas soil B needed uh, 200 pounds per acre. Um, you all might have heard of the CO2 burst test, which is part of the Haney test. And so I put those values down here below um, each of their EONRs. So this CO2 burst was 388. The, um, uh, this uh, soil's CO2 burst was 146. And these are data from Alan Franzluber's in uh, Virginia and North Carolina. And here are the data uh, for each of those soils, soil A and B, and uh, uh, dozens of other sites where they've tested this nitrogen response curve. And on the bottom of this axis is a normalized CO2 burst. So I had to normalize it because there are two studies that use different tests and the ranges are slightly different. There are also different soil types. So we've got Matt Yost and Alan Franzuber studies overlaid on each other showing the scales up at the top. On the bottom axis is the normalized CO2 burst from a zero to one. Uh, based on each study, and then the economic optimum nitrogen rate, or how much nitrogen uh, a producer would need to add to get to the um, non-nitrogen limited yield. And here's where our soils map on this. Here's soil B, here's soil A. Overall, across all these studies, both from the Midwest and in, um, in uh, 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 North Carolina and Virginia, um, we show there's a lot of variability in noise, including a lot of soils down here that tested zero but had a wide range in CO2 burst, right? So these soils didn't need any uh, nitrogen. However, they had a wide variety of uh, CO2 bursts. So we need to understand this more in order to better predict nitrogen needs and connect soil health or biological activity, which is what this test is measuring, to um, corn nitrogen needs. However, just a cursory glance, if we look at uh, both of these studies combined, we see that for every about 10% increase in the CO2 burst test across each study, um, you can reduce nitrogen rate by 24 pounds of nitrogen to get the same agronomic optimum nitrogen rate at that site. Okay, sorry folks, I had to pick up with um, 
using a different video recording software, I kept having issues with uh, the, the video recording software I usually use for my class. Um, let's try it again. I, I only have a few more slides, but I wanted to, to final, finally talk about um, what you all been he hearing about and all the buzz surrounding soil carbon and ecosystem service markets. So if the uh, economic improvements from increased water holding capacity or increased um, nitrogen or nutrient supplying power through soil health doesn't convince you, maybe this will uh, convince you. So here are those five principles of soil health um, at the top here I got from the NRCS. And here are um, six soil health promoting practices and the amount of soil organic carbon change. And these are from meta-analyses. These are the references. If you're interested in seeing these PDFs, just let me know and I can send them to you. So this is the megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. So this is a stock of carbon that's increased per unit of area, hectare rather than acre per year, plus or minus the standard deviation or a bit of error there. And so that's the mean and the standard deviation. Then this value is the percent change. So the percent change from the control um, and to carrying out whatever practice it is. So here it might be distillage versus no-till, uh, a monoculture crop versus a diverse rotation, uh, cropping to CRP or restored prairie, uh, cover crops, et cetera. And this shows you um, kind of the percent increase you could expect to have per year. So if you start with a soil, that's 1% and you're increasing at about 2%, you're increasing um, 0.02% carbon or organic matter per year. This is the number of studies that are kind of incorporated in this average, the mean study years. Um, so this just shows that uh, many of the studies are only three years long, a little bit longer for the CRP or restored prairie, 23 years, um, and uh, um, uh, 18 or 14 years for crop rotation or conservation tillage. And then how deep these studies sampled. So 20, about uh, 20 centimeters up to 30 centimeters. So thir or 30 centimeters is one foot. Um, so many of the studies shallow, sample very shallowly, even um, uh, less than six inches up to 300 centimeters, which is uh, about 10 feet deep. And so this is uh, kind of a summarized, uh, very rough look at, at what these conservation practices do, but they all increase soil carbon generally. There are some studies that show either neutral or, or sometimes negative effects, but on average, they, they tend to increase soil carbon, whether you look at it from a concentration or the change in the stock, which you need a bulk density and a depth value. And this is what has built all these uh, uh, carbon markets around, and this is an example from my colleague in the economics department at Iowa State, um, showing the, the, the data and the payments flow through these carbon programs. So there are methods and third party assessors that can come out and, and sometimes they involve private testing labs and sampling every three to five years, soil sampling every three to five years, and then the carbon payments um, hopefully end up in producers' pockets. And this I'm bringing this up in this session just because this can be an additional um, source of income through, uh, uh, in, through soil health. So currently averages uh, estimate between 10 to $60 per acre per year for soil carbon credits. Um, and this is the, the price uh, in all these different carbon markets um, in different countries. So Sweden has the highest cost. Um, and has a low share of greenhouse gases. EU uh, has a moderate cost. Um, Canada, $30. Uh, California cap and trade between 15 and 20. But here are the major take homes. One, soil health promoting practices can increase yield and soil organic carbon. That I hope I convinced you of. More research is needed on the multiple benefits of soil health promoting practices, including being able to reduce uh, fertilizer inputs, um, I, that recommendation from the CO2 burst test is uh, promising pre preliminary evidence, but we need more 
more data before we can start recommending reduction in fertilizer based on soil health tests. And then we need to consider the co-benefits and trade-off. And co-benefits are um, a benefit that you're not intending for, but that happen to occur with a, a change in practice. For example, uh, crop rotations increase soil organic carbon, and they happen to increase crop yields, as I showed from that meta-analysis earlier. Um, trade-offs, there's no, no tillage increases soil organic carbon, but decreases crop yields, as I showed from the two um, meta-analyses. So those kind of uh, benef co-benefits and trade-offs need to be considered if you're thinking about um, soil health as a, a, a venue or a, a pathway to profit. Um, uncertainty in the carbon and, and ecosystem markets makes this time uh, and, and counting on soil health promoting uh, um, profits is, makes it a little bit um, unsure. And then we need to think about other intangible, intangible benefits, like for example, increasing your land value with um, soil health promoting practices. This is sort of like the CSR2, or those of you not familiar, the corn suitability rating uh, version two. Uh, this includes a lot of soil factors and it's what land assessors use to assess the value of property. And currently it doesn't uh, take into effect management practices. Uh, some land assessors that I've, I've worked with, they tell me that um, some land assessors look at soil fertility tests um, just to give it, get an idea, but that's, that's even not very typical. But maybe perhaps in the future, we can look at um, valuing land based on how it was treated through uh, via soil health practicing or promoting uh, practices. And at this time, I'll take any questions. Hopefully my videos worked okay if I couldn't pipe in online and uh, in case they couldn't and um, I should have time to, to talk to you all, but you can email me at March, M-A-R-S-H, at iastate.edu and, and follow the, the um, stuff we do on Twitter at soil underscore plant underscore IXNS, which just stands for interactions. And this is a photo of one soil health promoting practice I mentioned. This is a beautiful photo taken by Omar de Koch Mercado of a prairie strip in a cornfield um, providing lots of ecosystem services for Dick Sloan's farm near Raleigh, Iowa. All right, thank you. I will take any questions at this time.